Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. Today we're going over lesson 6.8, and the topic of this lesson is the Wittig reaction. Now, a special type of nucleophile is used in this Wittig reaction, and it's called a phosphonium illid. I'm going to show you how to generate this phosphonium illid as part of this process. But once you have this special nucleophile, this is a type D reaction, which means you replace the entire carbonyl carbon. This phosphonium illid is a carbon-centered nucleophile, and what you do is replace the CO double bond of the carbonyl with a CC double bond so that your product is an alkene. Let me talk you through how you generate this phosphonium illid because this is often an important part of the Wittig reaction you see, whether you're doing this in the lab or doing this for an exam for a class. You take a phosphine. So a phosphine is like an amine in that it's a phosphorus with a lone pair, and it has three R groups, right? An amine would be a nitrogen with a lone pair with three R groups. And phosphorus is in the same column of the periodic table as nitrogen. So you can kind of think of it like that. But a phosphorus with a lone pair is a pretty good nucleophile because phosphorus is a larger atom. It doesn't hold on to those lone pairs very strongly compared to an electronegative atom like an oxygen or nitrogen. So pretty good nucleophile. The first step then is to take an alkyl halide where this X group could be a chlorine or bromine or iodine. You do a simple SN2 reaction. Now when a neutral phosphorus donates its lone pair, it of course becomes positive. And the name for a positively charged phosphorus with four bonds to it is a phosphonium. Kind of like an ammonium is a nitrogen with four bonds with a plus charge. Now a very common phosphine to use is one with three phenyl groups. So triphenylphosphine the species reacts with an alkyl halide to make a triphenylphosphonium, onium telling you it's positively charged, and halide indicates that's your counter anion. Now we don't yet have a nucleophile, because if you look at this species, you've got a positive charge on it. You don't have a negative charge or a lone pair that you could think about using as a nucleophilic part of this molecule. So you use a strong base, and quite often this is n-butyl lithium. So here I've shown the lithium already dissociated as if this is ionic. We know that's an approximation. And this is a strong base. It's able to take the proton away and leave a minus charge on the carbon. Now that's possible for a couple reasons, right? Usually you can't just take a proton off of a sp3 hybridized carbon. But here you see that the minus charge is right by a positive charge, which helps stabilize it by that Coulombic attractive force. And you can actually draw a resonance contributor where you draw a double bond between the phosphorus and carbon. Now whether you draw the species in this resonance contributor or this resonance contributor. This is called the phosphonium illid. Y-L-I-D is pronounced illid. And for me, the easiest way to envision the reactivity of the phosphonium illid with a carbonyl compound is to draw it in this form where you have a negative charge and say, okay, I know that a negative charge will be attracted to the carbonyl carbon, and I can use the pi bond of this to be attracted to the plus charge on the phosphorus. You could draw it as the double bond between the phosphorus and carbon and the double bond between the oxygen and the carbon of the carbonyl. And you could draw a reaction like this. So you could do it with either resonance contributor. I'm showing you one here. And this process makes a four-membered ring kind of like what we saw with the Chauvin mechanism. If you think back to the alkene metathesis, if you've read that lesson already. So we get the product in box A. And what we have is a strained four-membered ring. So why would we do this reaction to make this strained ring? Well, for one thing, we have a nice neutral carbon instead of a charged carbon. Right? The phosphonium illid is a pretty unstable species. We get rid of an unstable species, and at the same time, we make a phosphorus-oxygen bond. The phosphorus-oxygen bond happens to be one of the strongest of the covalent bonds. So making strong bonds is very favorable. And then, this is actually only a temporary species. It's not yet our final product. What we actually do is open up this four-membered ring to relieve the ring strain. And by doing so, we make a phosphorus-oxygen double bond. So I've written it out in the condensed formula here, but this phosphorus-oxygen is a double bond. The PO double bond is very strong, and that helps push the reaction forward as well. Oftentimes, you can even choose a solvent where the triphenylphosphine oxide, this species, precipitates out. And you see this arrow here that I've drawn pushes another pair of electrons between these two carbons. So that leads to a carbon-carbon double bond. And that's how we get our 
alkene. Now, I want to point out one really important thing about this, and that is that when we get these alkene products, we have the possibility for making EZ or cis-trans isomers. Right? The major alkene product formed is generally the cis or the Z alkene. If you think about it, you say, well, the cis alkene is less stable than the trans, so why would I be forced to get the cis product as my major product? Well, it comes down to the stability of this intermediary species, the four-membered ring. And if you look in the primer in lesson 6.8, you see this very, very large group. Remember that phenyl is an abbreviation for benzene. So this is very, very large. Pushing the R groups away from this huge group towards each other instead, as they would be in a cis alkene, and then having this alkene bond form, is actually what pushes this reaction forward. So you can look at the little picture I draw of this intermediate where I try to show you the shape in the primer to review that. But this is the general rule that you'd usually get a cis or Z alkene. And this reaction works for R and H cases, so ketones and aldehyde. And if you're following along in the printable notes on the Proton Guru website, there's this little notes panel at the bottom. This is where you write down your own notes of what you think are important things to remember, or maybe you're in someone's class and they tell you important things about the reaction. And here I just want to show you a way that a Wittig reaction is very often represented on standardized tests or class exams in organic chemistry. Now, a simple way to show it would be to show you the carbonyl and to show you the phosphonium ilid like this or in the other resonance contributor with a double bond. And what I hope you would think when you saw that is say, okay, well, this is the nucleophilic piece. I know that a driving force for the Wittig reaction is to make the phosphorus oxygen double bond. So if I think about sort of a metathesis or trading of pieces where the phosphorus trades the CH2 piece for the O, then this piece came from the carbonyl and doubly bound to the piece that came from the phosphonium, which is a CH2 in this case. That's sort of a thought process you can go through just sort of thinking through the pieces that go together. That's a simple way to represent a Wittig reaction. But I mentioned that a lot of times you'll be asked to make your phosphonium illid nucleophile first. That's what this sort of representation at the top of this slide represents. So we have to think this through. We have one bromobutane, which will look like this we have triphenylphosphine. Now, when you have something with a leaving group, an alkyl halide, you generally think about SN1, SN2, E1, E2 type processes. And the phosphorus with a lone pair is a good nucleophile. You can go back and look at lesson 2.2 in the primer to show you that. And you'd have to think through, okay, after that process, I will have the triphenylphosphonium and the bromide leaving group. So I've made this phosphonium salt. Then in step two, you have the n-butyllithium. In this case, we're going to use it as a strong base. And the most acidic site is, of course, the site right by the plus charge. Because when a base takes this proton away and leaves the conjugate base, you've made the most stable conjugate base you could make if you look at all the different protons you might potentially take off. Now you don't need this counter anion because you have the minus charge and the plus charge right beside each other. You can draw your phosphonium illid like this. You could alternatively draw your phosphonium illid with a double bond between the phosphorus and carbon. So regardless of how we draw this nucleophile, this illid, we need to draw out the reagent we're going to use here. It's benzaldehyde, it looks like this. And we think we're going to do sort of a metathesis of pieces. We're trading the pieces to get the triphenyl phosphine oxide, making that very strong phosphorus double bond O. And then this piece that came in the end from the butane piece over here and attaching it with a double bond to this piece of the carbonyl. So we used to have the carbonyl oxygen here in benzaldehyde. It's gone. And now we have one, two, three, four carbons from the butane piece. One, two, three, four. And I'm making the Z isomer, as I learned, would be the major product for a Wittig reaction. And this would be my major product. And I just wanted to go through one example of how you would seemingly be starting with a alkyl halide, but a carbonyl compound comes in later. So you're kind of combining your knowledge of doing substitution reactions, some acid-base chemistry, and then a carbonyl reaction that is the Wittig reaction.